Well, good morning once again. <clears throat> Brethren, I would like this morning to turn our attention to uh, something, to a particular lesson, some examples that are given in Scripture and some lessons that uh, we can learn from it because we want to take and apply and understand uh, some things that uh, are directly applicable to us. Back in the book of Exodus, we are introduced to the fact that uh, God begins to instruct Moses uh, about the uh, uh, a plan that he has. And in Exodus chapter 25, <clears throat> Exodus 25 and verse 8, God told Moses, he said, Let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them, according to all that I show you after the pattern of of the tabernacle and the pattern of all the instruments thereof, even so shall you make it. So we find that a sanctuary was to be built for the purpose that God might dwell among his people. We also find that everything was to be made according to the pattern that God gave to Moses. He came on down and he in verse 16, began to discuss something that was perhaps the, the crucial element at the center of all of this that was going to be made. Because in verse 16, uh, well, in verse 10, he, st he talks about making an ark, making a, a box. That's what it means. Uh, it's uh, two cubits and a half in the length, a cubit and a half the breadth, and a cubit and a half the height. So it's made uh, like a box. It is overlaid with gold. It has rings at the four corners so that it might be carried with a long a staff. And uh, they, those were made and overlaid with gold. And inside this box, this ark as it's called, the ark of, uh, you shall put into the ark the testimony that I will give you. And then you were to go on, Moses was told, and to make a mercy seat. And this was a lid for the covering of this box. And it was uh, one of the remarkable things on this lid was that there were two great uh, carabim, uh that were there out of, uh, uh, out of gold, as it describes. They were to be made of, uh, uh, made of gold. And uh, they were to be set there on this, uh, on this lid. And the carabim would stretch forth their wings, verse 20, and they would be looking at one another, and the wings would be, uh, uh, the wings would be stretched out. So it, uh, uh, you know, it describes the way that this is to be done and goes on, and it describes various articles and, and uh, pieces of the furniture and all the different things uh, that were to be made for this tabernacle. This tabernacle that was to be built so that God might dwell among the children of Israel. Now, in uh, the uh, uh, what, what we find here as we come on down to Exodus chapter 40, in verse 1, the Eternal spoke unto Moses, saying, On the first day of the first month, you shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of the congregation, and you shall put therein the ark of the testimony and cover the ark with a veil. So, the ark was to be placed there. The ark was symbolic of the very throne of God. It contained the two tables of stone where God had written with his own finger the Ten Commandments. And it was covered over by the mercy seat that was symbolic of God's very throne. It was to be placed in the inner sanctum. As you, I won't go through and read all the details, but I think you're familiar uh, that the tabernacle, as it was originally built, of course, the tabernacle was a temporary dwelling. It was a tent. Uh, it was quite an elaborate tent. It wasn't the kind of thing you go down and buy from Sears and Roebuck. Uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a remarkable tent, and there were all sorts of things. Uh, but it was a tent. It was a temporary dwelling, and the major room of it uh, was the, the tabernacle or the tent itself, was divided into two rooms. Uh, the first two-thirds of it was what was called the holy place, and then the back one-third was the holy of holies. 
And the back one-third was sealed off from the front two-thirds with this big, heavy curtain that hung down. It separated. In the holy place was uh, the table that contained 12 loaves of showbread, bread of presence, bread that was presented in the presence of God. It contained the altar of incense, and it contained the... Uh, Seven lamp, uh, the the lampstand with the seven branches uh, on it that were over against the uh, you know the other side. The, the table of showbread was on one side, the lampstand was on the other, and the ark and the uh, uh, altar of incense was sitting in the middle, but right sort of in front of the curtain. Now behind the curtain, into that inner sanctum, the holy of holies, only the high priest was allowed to go once a year. Now we find all of this inside the holy of holies was the Ark of the Covenant. That was what was in there. That was symbolic of Christ's very, uh, or of God's very presence, of God's very throne. Well, it describes that, and it describes here in chapter 40, uh, them going through and setting up the various aspects. And then in verse 9, they were to take, you were to take the anointing oil and anoint the tabernacle and hallow it and the vessels, and they shall be holy. They anointed the altar and all of the vessels, anoint the labor, uh, and then uh, bring Aaron and his sons unto the door of the tabernacle and wash them with water, uh, this big laver there that contained water uh, that the priests must wash in before they were able to enter inside the holy place. Aaron and his Aaron was to put on holy garments that he might minister to me in the priest's office. He was to put on holy garments, uh, anoint him, sanctify him. And it goes on and describes this. Verse 16, Thus did Moses according to all that the Lord commanded him. So he did. And it came to pass in the first month, in the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was reared up. So we're just two weeks short of one year after Israel had begun their exodus out of Egypt. On the first day of the first month of the second year. The tabernacle is now reared up. Moses reared up the tabernacle, verse 18, fastened the sockets and set up the boards and, and, and uh, you know, put this whole structure together and spread, verse 19, the tent and put the covering of the tent as the Lord commanded him. Then he took and put the testimony into the ark, the two tables of stone that Moses had brought down from the mountain. Moses had spent 40 days in the mountain communing with God. You remember the story. And Israel, in the meantime, had corrupted themselves. He came down, uh, saw what they had done, smashed the tables of stone. And then he spent 40 days down out of the mountain dealing with Israel, uh, praying to God for mercy in their behalf, mercy for the people, mercy for Aaron. Then, at the end of that, he went back up into the mountain, was up there another 40 days. This time, he was told to hew out two tables of stone, bring up two tables, just like he had taken down. But he took them up blank, and God, again, wrote on them with his own finger. The Ten Commandments, written with the finger of God. Now, Moses, who's had this in his possession now for several months, these... Uh, uh, tables of the testimony. He took them and he put them into the ark. And he set the staves on the ark and put the mercy seat above upon the ark. So he takes this box, puts the Ten Commandments inside, puts the, uh, the staves through the rings so that it can be properly carried. Now he puts the mercy seat on it. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle. Verse 21, set up the veil of the covering and covered the ark of the testimony as the Lord commanded Moses. He put the table in the tent, and it describes uh, the, the table here of the showbread was put outside of the veil, and he put the candlestick, as he describes, and he lit the candles. He did all of these things, the golden altar, uh, did all these things, and then we find in verse, 30, uh, in verse 33, he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar, set up the hanging of the court gate, so Moses finished the work, the job that God had given him to do in this regard. Now notice what happened next. Then a cloud covered the tent of the congregation, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon, and the glory of the Eternal filled 
the tabernacle. You can just imagine, you know, it's like this bright, shining, glowing cloud that begins to come down and to just fill the inside, almost like some, uh, you know, radiant fog or something, a, a thick cloud that just settles into uh, the tabernacle and, and goes in there and, and it describes it as the glory of the eternal. When the cloud was taken up from over the tabernacle, there was a cloud, you know, above uh, the tabernacle, the children of Israel went in, on their journeys. If the cloud wasn't taken up, they didn't journey until it was. And uh, so uh, the cloud was upon the tabernacle by day and fire by night in the sight of all the house of Israel throughout their journeys. This remarkable event, God was dwelling among them. God was leading them. And here was something that was patterned exactly as Moses was instructed by God in the mountain. It was based on the pattern that God had given. It was built for the purpose that God might dwell among them. Now let's notice another detail of the dedication. We saw here this reference to the, uh, uh, to the uh, dedication of the tabernacle and the cloud filling it. When you turn over the very next page, which is the book of Leviticus, the uh, Lord called to Moses, Leviticus 1.1, 1, 1, spoke unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation and began to give him instruction about offerings because the, uh, there were offerings that were uh, to be made. This was for the purpose of, of uh, enabling individuals to enter into communion and fellowship with God. As we uh, come on down through the book of Leviticus just a little bit further, we, uh, when we come on back here to, to uh, uh, chapter 7, gives the details about a trespass offering and, and various other things. And these are the things that uh, God commanded, we're told, in verse 38. Now, in chapter 8, God told Moses, this is... These are events that, uh, uh, these are coming back, this is coming back and picking up details, you see, that uh, uh, had been given prior to the, uh, to the tabernacle being set up. Because God had given the instructions in Leviticus 1 through 7 were instructions God had given Moses in the mount. But they're laid out now because this is instructions to the Levites. Moses was, ta was told in chapter 8 uh, to take Aaron and his sons with him and his garments and the holy oil and the bullock. Uh, and two rams and a basket of unleavened bread and gather all the congregation. <laughs> and he was, this is now, uh, the tabernacle is set up and he is preparing to consecrate Aaron as a priest because Aaron is to minister for the children of Israel. And so he, come, he describes here that the holy garments that are put on Aaron, we read about that earlier, uh, describes them now in detail uh, in verses uh, 7 and 8. And nine, and uh, the describes the anointing of the tabernacle and all of the various uh, items. The anointing of Aaron in verse twelve, and uh, the anointing of Aaron's sons, and describes the offerings that were to be made and all of the details of the offerings at this time. And uh, Aaron and his sons were told that they were to wait there in the tabernacle uh, at the door. Um, this is Leviticus 8.35. Uh, he shall abide at the door of the tabernacle day and night seven days. And so they did what God commanded them. And on the eighth day, Moses called Aaron and his sons and the elders, and he told them to take a, a young calf for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And uh, he goes through the details of this offering that is to be done. And... Uh, uh, verse 5, they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation. And all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. And Moses said, this is the thing which the Lord commanded that you should do. And the glory of the Lord shall appear unto you. And so Moses told Aaron, you go to the altar and offer your sin offering. And Aaron went and slew the, the uh, calf. Uh, verse 8, and uh, they sprinkled the blood and they piled everything up and brought the burnt offering, verse 16. Uh, did the various things, uh, waved the uh, wave offering, verse 21. 
Verse 22, Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them. And came down from the offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and the peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle. Then they came out and blessed the people. And the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their face. You better believe. You know, Moses and Aaron have gone in uh, here to the tabernacle. They come back out. And the glory of the Lord, this, this radiant cloud, comes in and begins to fill everything. And then... There is a fire that comes out from before the Lord. In other words, from the Holy of Holies, from the Ark of the Covenant, from the mercy seat. It's like this lightning bolt shoots out and comes right out the door of the tabernacle and ignites this offering there on the altar of burnt offering. Quite a dramatic dedication of the tabernacle, something built according to the pattern that God had set and God said that it was to be built so that He might dwell among the people. Now, God makes it very plain that He's dwelling among the people. The glory of God fills the tabernacle. The fire of God comes out from the mercy seat, comes out from the ark, comes out from the Holy of Holies, and ignites this sacrifice. And you can just imagine, uh, you know, this... this uh, altar piled up with all this meat and the fat and all the things that are laying there and this fire comes out and this you know, huge uh, flame that begins to shoot many feet up into the air. People saw it and they shouted and fell on their face. That's uh, probably an understatement. You, you can imagine you know, what, what it must have been. Well, we come through the story all through the events of the tabernacle uh, that Moses had built. And hundreds of years have gone by. In fact, about, uh, you know, 400, almost 480 years go by. And actually 479 from the dedication of the tabernacle, 480 from the Exodus. We come to a time in the fourth year of Solomon, King Solomon, when the foundation of a temple is built. You remember earlier... King David, Solomon's father, had talked to Nathan the prophet and he said, you know, it doesn't seem right. I'm dwelling in a house of wood and stone. I'm dwelling in a nice, solid building, a beautiful palace. And the ark of God dwells in a tent. The ark of God, that which is symbolic of the very presence of God, the very throne of God, is dwelling in a tent. That doesn't, I don't feel right about that, David said. I feel like that if I'm going to live in a palace, the ark of God needs to dwell in a temple, something far greater, far more impressive than the palace that I live. Well, Nathan said, you know, that sounds like a good idea. I'm sure God would, would bless you in that. Yet, a little later, God came to Nathan and says, you go back and tell David he's not going to build the temple. I appreciate that he wants to build a house. I'll let him do the preparation, but David has made some mistakes. He has shed much blood upon the earth. And I'm not going to let him be the one to build my temple. He can prepare for it. He can handle all the details. But uh, his, I, I will give him a son, and his son will be the one that will build the temple. Well, as you go through the uh, story uh, coming on and, and the account is given in First Chronicles and it's also given uh, here, that's the primary account. There's reference in, in Second Samuel and First Kings as well. But we find that David made all the preparations. The last part of Second of First Chronicles is taken up with the, the preparation that David made and the things that he did. And uh, uh, David told Solomon that um, in First uh, Chronicles 28, verse 9, he said, You, Solomon, my son, know that know you the God of your father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. For the eternal searches all hearts and he understands all the imaginations of the thoughts. 
So we're to serve God, what? We're to serve Him with our heart and with our mind. We're to serve with a willing mind, with a yielded, uh, with our thoughts yielded to God, with a, a sincere heart, sincere motives. God searches our hearts. He searches our motives. And He understands all of our thoughts. We're to serve Him with our thoughts and with our feelings. If you seek Him, God, told, uh, God speaking through David, David was the one who was addressing Solomon, if you seek Him, He'll be found of you, but if you forsake Him, He'll cast you off forever. Take heed now, for the Lord has chosen you to build a house for the sanctuary. Be strong and do it. And David gave to Solomon, his son, the pattern. And the pattern, verse 12, the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. Notice the pattern. God gave Moses the pattern directly in the mouth. And Moses was to build everything according to the pattern that God gave him. He didn't tell Moses, now I want you to go down and see how the Egyptians did theirs. and Sort of look around some of the Canaanites and some of the Edomites and some of these various tribes. Sort of look and see the way they worship their gods and see if you come up with any good ideas. That's not the way God went about it. God doesn't tell us to look and see what the world does and see if, you know, maybe this is sort of a nice idea and that's sort of catchy and that looks pretty good. God gave Moses the pattern. And Moses built an ark of the covenant, and he built the tabernacle and all of the furniture, and he set this up based on the pattern God had given him in the mountain. And the ark of the covenant, now we are well over 400 years, all, about 480 years on down. This is uh, you know, an incredible length of time that all of this has, has gone on. Now, David is giving Solomon a pattern, and it's the pattern that he had by the Spirit. You see, God's Spirit led David to design the pattern of the temple, which was based on the pattern of the tabernacle. The dimensions were different, and there were certain uh, things, but, but the overall pattern of the uh, tabernacle, uh, the rectangular building, the first two-thirds being the holy place, and the last third being the holy of holies, and the place for the ark and the table of showbread and the candlestick and the, and the altar of incense and the laver and the burnt, altar of burnt offering. All of that was, was based on the outline that God had given to Moses in the tabernacle. But now it's being, a, a temple is being built. A great, grand building. And um, this is the pattern that God had given him and all the details. And so we find as we get into Second Chronicles, that uh, uh, Solomon began to build, chapter 3, the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. This is where the Eternal appeared unto David his father in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan the Jebusite. He began to build in the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. Now, you know, God had stopped a plague on Israel, an angel appeared uh, over just on the outskirts of Jerusalem with his sword drawn. David fell on his face and besought God and then went there. The angel was directly, he says he was, you know, between heaven and earth. He was up directly above uh, this man's threshing floor. Ornan and his sons were out threshing. They looked up, saw the angel. The sons took off and hid and uh, Ornan bowed his face to the ground. David came there and uh, uh, built an altar and offered an, altar, an offering to God at that time, beseeching God for mercy. And he looked up in an incredible sight. You know, this angel that is there stationary, perhaps for a period of hours as all of this has been going on, with his sword drawn, when the offering is made, the angel then takes his sword and puts it in his sheath. Uh, the sword is... Uh, 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 the sword is sheathed, and uh, uh, this is described uh, back in uh, uh, back in First Chronicles 21. Now it's interesting, uh, as you note here. Uh, in first, we'll just turn back briefly. David 
went up, and in verse 20 we're told, we'll pick it up in verse 20 of First Chronicles 21, Ornan turned back and he saw the angel. His four sons with him hid, him, hid themselves. Uh, you know, you, can you imagine being out here, and, and they're out here threshing wheat, they're minding their own business, you know, they're out here uh, threshing away the wheat, and all of a sudden they look up, you know, maybe one of them looked up and said, hey, what's that? And they all looked up. Next thing you know, boy, those sons, had, had they were getting out of there. They, they weren't sticking around. Uh, Ornan, uh, uh, when Ornan saw the angel, David came there to Ornan, and, and uh, Ornan looked, and he saw David, and he bowed to David. And uh, David said, look, I would want to offer a sacrifice. I want to, to buy this uh, uh, threshing floor you have to build an altar to the Lord. And at first, Ornan just wanted to give it to him, and David said, no, I, I need to pay you. I'm not going to offer an offering to God that doesn't cost me anything. And so they, he paid him. And verse 26, David built an altar unto the Lord, offered burnt offerings and peace offerings, called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered him from heaven by fire upon the altar of burnt offerings. And the Lord commanded the angel, and he put up his sword again into the sheep. And when David saw that the Lord had answered him, uh, in the threshing floor of Ornan, and then he sacrificed there. And uh, so we find that uh, here an altar is made, and this great event, and David piles up the altar with the, the carcasses of the sacrificial animals and prayed to God, and God answered by fire. This fire comes down literally out of heaven. Now, we saw earlier when the tabernacle was dedicated, fire came out of the holy place. Now, fire comes from heaven and ignites the sacrifices on this altar. David now recognizes this as the chosen place, the place where the temple of God, where the altar of God is to be set, that God has set his name. So Solomon now, as we read the account in Second Chronicles 3, Solomon now begins to build the house of the Lord on the place where God had appeared to David uh, in uh, on the threshing floor of Horn. And it goes through and describes all of the various things uh, of the uh, involved in building the altar and the uh, describes the furniture in, in uh, uh, chapter 4. And then in chapter 5, the, uh, we come to the dedication. And verse 4, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 4, all the elders of Israel came and the Levites took up the ark. This was at the time of the Feast of Tabernacles, we're told in 2 Chronicles 5, 3, the Feast of the Seventh Month. The Levites took up the ark and brought up the ark and the tabernacle of the congregation and all the holy vessels. The tabernacle that Moses had built and the ark and it was all brought here to the temple. And King Solomon and the congregation that were assembled, and they sacrificed sheep and oxen that couldn't be, that couldn't be numbered. The priests, verse 7, brought in the ark of the covenant of the Lord unto his place, to the oracle of the house, the most holy place, under the wings of the cherubim. And they drew out the staves, showing that the ark was now to remain. It wasn't to be carried any further. And... There was nothing, verse 10, in the ark except the two tables of stone that Moses put therein at Horeb when the Lord made a covenant. So that was what was inside. The Ten Commandments, the fundamental law of God. That's what was under the mercy seat, inside the ark of the covenant. When the priests came out and all of this, that uh, coming on down in the latter part of verse 13, the house was filled with a cloud even the house of God, so that the priest could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of the eternal had filled the house of God. So here, again, a similar miracle to what had occurred uh, centuries earlier when the, uh, when the Ark of the Covenant had been placed in the tabernacle for the first time. That the glory of God, this cloud, filled the tabernacle. Now this cloud fills the temple. And Solomon prays to God, and it describes the uh, Solomon's prayer. In chapter 7, verse 1, When Solomon made an end of praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offerings and the sacrifices, and the glory of the eternal filled the house. 
And the priest couldn't enter into the house of the Lord because the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And when all the children of Israel saw how the fire came down and the glory of the Lord upon the house, they bowed themselves with their face to the ground upon the pavement and worshipped. A very overwhelming experience. Time went by. And you know, you would think, if you were there, if you had been there at the time of the dedication of the temple by Moses, if you had been there or the dedication of the tabernacle by Moses, if you had been there at the dedication of the temple by Solomon, if you could have seen the glory of God fill the house, if you could have seen the fire come down and consume the sacrifices, would you have had any doubt that God was there, that that was God's work? Would you have had any doubt that that's... That that was of God. You know, sometimes we think if we could have we could see or could have seen such an impressive event, it would set us on the straight and narrow for the rest of our life. You know, Moses had a cousin that was there involved in the uh, matter of actually doing some of the physical setting up the tabernacle. He was actually involved in in putting those things together and helping to bring the ark in and set it in. His cousin's name was Korah. And you read about Korah a little bit later in the book of Numbers. Korah's the guy that tried to get the rebellion together uh, to put himself in charge and get rid of Moses. Korah was a Levite. He was Moses' cousin. He was there involved in, in setting up the tabernacle and bringing in the ark. He was right there. He saw the fire. He saw the cloud. He experienced the glory of God and the presence of God. And yet, somehow you have to conclude God wasn't very real to Korah. Korah looked upon Moses as somehow, well, you know, who do you think you are? I've known you, you know, and and our families are, are related and I don't see where... You know, you you just sort of maneuvered yourself and made yourself a prince. Amazing. Now, Solomon was right there. Can you imagine making a prayer and when you get up, you see fire come down from heaven? Boy, talk about an answer. The glory of God filled the temple. Fire came down from heaven. You would think, you know, Solomon would have a memory that would never dim for the rest of his life. Yet, we're told, Solomon, as Solomon got older, he married all these strange women, wound up with 700 wives and 300 concubines, and we're told his wives turned away his heart. Pretty obvious, you know, where, what Solomon was thinking about, and where his heart was, wasn't on God. And so then we're told, as you go through the account in, in uh, 1 Kings, that Solomon built... Uh, altars and allowed idol altars uh, to be built there in Jerusalem. And uh, uh, he built these altars for all these wives and they had all this stuff uh, uh, all this all this stuff going on. Solomon right virtually in the shadow of the temple that God had built that God had glorified Solomon allowed idol altars to be built. Well, as you come on back through the story, we find that there were those who had the idea that because they lived in Jerusalem, because they lived right there where the tabernacle was, where the, or not the tabernacle, but the temple, the altar, even though they had forsaken God in their lives and in their lack of obedience, that somehow... They were protected because they were right there. And that God would have to watch over the temple because after all, that was God's house. Jeremiah 7, God told Jeremiah, I want you to go stand in the gate of the Lord's house and proclaim there this word and say, Hear the word of the Lord, all you of Judah that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. 
Don't trust in lying words saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. If you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor and don't oppress the stranger, the fatherless, the widow, then, verse 7, I'll cause you to dwell in this place, you trust in lying words that cannot profit. Then you come, verse 10, and stand before me in this house called by my name and say, we're delivered to do all these abominations. Is this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? Verse 12, you go to the place, my place in Shiloh, where I set my name at first and see what I did to it for the wickedness of my people Israel. You see, Shiloh was nothing but an empty field by this time. Shiloh is where the tabernacle of God sat for hundreds of years. And yet the time came because of the sins uh, that the ark was removed. That was where uh, the, the tabernacle and the ark was at the time when God allowed the Philistines to capture the ark. The Philistines didn't keep it. You know, God could take care of his own ark, and he brought it back, but the ark was never returned to Shiloh. And ultimately, the tabernacle or the temple of Solomon was built, and the ark was placed there in the Holy of Holies. Now we're down to the time of, of Jeremiah. We're down to a time of, of well over 300 years from uh, the uh, event that uh, perhaps about 370 or 80 years uh, that uh, have transpired since the dedication of so uh, the time of Solomon's temple on down now to the time of Jeremiah. And the people have departed from God, and somehow they're trusting. Being in the presence of the city where God had said his name, being in the presence of the temple where God had said his name, that they were protected. And God said, not so. In fact, it's interesting, Ezekiel, who was a contemporary of Jeremiah and writing a uh, uh, little bit... Uh, uh, a little bit later uh, than uh, than this, uh, right prior to the destruction of Jerusalem, Ezekiel goes through and he ta and he sees a uh, uh, he sees a vision in uh, uh, chapter ten of the book of Ezekiel, and uh, he looks and he sees all of these things that uh, uh, that are. Going on, God uh, gives him all of this. And uh, notice here that uh, uh, Ezekiel is, is brought in and uh, he's told that uh, uh, in chapter 10, verse 1, I looked and behold the firmament that was above the heads of the cherubim. Uh, there appeared over them so, something that looked like a sapphire stone as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And Ezekiel uh, saw here uh, the vision of the very throne of God standing over the temple. Verse 3, the cherubim stood on the right side of the house. When the man went in, the cloud filled the inner court. The glory of, of the Lord went up from the cherub and stood over the threshold of the house. And the house was filled with the cloud and the court was full of the brightness of the Lord's glory. And so he saw all of these things. And Ezekiel sees this tremendous vision right here shortly before the temple was destroyed. He saw this vision of the glory of God there in the temple. And uh, he was describes this, this vision and he sees these cherubim and, and the uh, throne of God. Then we're told in verse 18, the glory of the Lord departed from off the threshold of the house and stood over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth in my sight. So Ezekiel sees this vision of the throne of God standing over the temple. He sees the glory of God filling the house. And then he sees the glory of God departing from the temple, coming here, standing over the cherubim. And the cherubim lifted up their wings and mounted up from the earth. The glory of God departed from the temple. And then 
we find the result, of course, was that the Babylonians came and destroyed the temple and destroyed Jerusalem. But as the glory of God departed from the temple, in verse 11 of, or chapter 11 of Ezekiel, Ezekiel says, The Spirit lifted me up and brought me into the east gate of the Lord's house. And he sees all of these things that, uh, that are there, that are prophecies ultimately for the house of Israel. But the events that happened in Jerusalem were a sign to the house of Israel that uh, God says in verse 16, the, Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, Although I have cast them far off among the nations, though I have scattered them among the countries, yet will I be to them as a little sanctuary in the countries where they come. Therefore say, Thus says the Lord God, I will gather you from the people, assemble you out of the countries. I'll bring you there. In verse 19, I will give them one heart. I'll put a new spirit within them. I'll take away the stony heart out of their flesh and give them a heart of flesh that they may walk in my statutes and keep my testimonies. God talked about a time when He would give them a new heart. But that temple was destroyed. The glory of God departed. The Jews went into a captivity that from the time of Nebuchadnezzar's first invasion lasted 70 years. Until after Babylon was overthrown by Cyrus of Persia, and then a decree was issued that allowed the return of Jews to Jerusalem. You read of that given in the book of Ezra. We find that a man who was a prince of the house of David, Zerubbabel by name, was appointed governor. And he led a group of Jews back out of Babylon, coming back to a desolate Judea. They came there, as is described here in Ezra. We just notice here at the beginning. The uh, describes the proclamation that's made in Ezra chapter 1. And then in Ezra 3, the seventh month was come. The children of Israel that were in the cities and the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And Joshua, the son of Josedak, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, and his brethren built the altar of the God of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as is written in the law of Moses. They set up the altar, for fear was upon them. They offered burnt offerings unto the Lord, morning and evening. They kept the Feast of Tabernacles. Verse 6, from the first day of the seventh month, Feast of Trumpets, they began to offer burnt offerings, but the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. They set up the altar and they dedicated it to God. And now they began the process of rebuilding the temple. And this story is told on through uh, Ezra chapter 5 and 6. And finally, we find in Ezra chapter 6 verse 15, the house was finished on the third day of the month Adar. That is the twelfth month of the calendar. Uh, just uh, This would be uh, uh, just a little over a month, about a month and a half before the... Uh, Passover and Days of Unleavened Bread. This was in the sixth year of King Darius. And the children of Israel and the priests and the Levites kept the dedication of the house of God with joy. And it describes the dedication, and then they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread. But as you go through and read the account carefully, you find that something was missing. When the tabernacle in the wilderness was dedicated, fire came out from before the Lord and ignited the sacrifices on the altar. When Jerusalem was selected and the threshing floor of Ornan was selected as the place where God's name would be set and the temple was to be built, fire came down from heaven and ignited the sacrifices on the altar. When Solomon dedicated the temple... After it was completed, fire came down from heaven, ignited the sacrifices. And just as it happened when the first tabernacle was dedicated, the glory of God filled the house. Tremendous event. But you see, 
as you go through and carefully read the story, when the second temple, the temple of Zerubbabel was built, there was no fire from heaven. There was no fire out of the holy place. There was no glory of God that filled the house. Ezra, in the book of Ezra, details various items of furniture, various treasures that... uh, had uh, been taken to Jerusalem and uh, uh, various vessels that Zerubbabel was allowed to bring back, as it describes in Ezra 5, uh, 14. The things that he brought. We even have Babylonian records of the treasures that were taken. Everything of value was taken out of the temple and transported to Babylon before the, tabernacle, before the temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar. But there is no record of the Ark of the Covenant, the most precious treasure in the temple. No record that it was ever taken to Babylon, it was never brought back. You see, what many people don't realize is that the Holy of Holies in the days from the time the second temple was rebuilt under Zerubbabel all the way down through the time of Jesus, all the way on uh, to the Roman destruction in 70 AD, the Holy of Holies was an empty room. There was nothing whatsoever in there. There was not a single article of furniture because all that had been in there under the time of Moses and the Temple of Solomon, all that had been in there was the Ark of the Covenant. It had the mercy seat, had the tables of stone inside, had the pot of uh, manna, had Aaron's rod that budded uh, laying up by the side of the Ark. All of the things pertaining to the Ark But the temple of Zerubbabel had only an empty room. An empty room sealed off by a curtain, the veil that set it off. It was the Holy of Holies. But you see, the Ark of the Covenant had disappeared. God had had it removed and hidden prior to the Babylonian destruction. I would presume that Jeremiah, who was God's leading prophet, God's servant there in Jerusalem at that time, who was also of the priestly family, I would, uh, I think it's a very logical conclusion that Jeremiah was responsible for the uh, removal of the ark and the placing of it where God wanted it to remain. But the point is that the second temple built under Zerubbabel did not have an ark in the holy place and There was no miraculous event at its dedication. Now, there were plenty of problems in the building of the second temple. If you read the story back in the book of Haggai, and and Ezra gives part of the story as well, you find that Zerubbabel and those that were with him began the building of the temple. And that the enemies of the people of God stirred up trouble and brought accusations and the work on the temple was stopped. And in the book of Haggai, chapter 1, we pick up the story in the second year of Darius. And we find here that work had been ceased on the temple for a period of time because of all this outward opposition and all the trouble that uh, had been stirred up. People had become intimidated, had become discouraged. And so, Haggai 1 verse 2, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the people say, The time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. You see, there were problems that had come up. As you read the story in the book of Ezra, you find that uh, there were uh, some of the enemies of the people of God round about the Samaritans and others that had made false accusations to the king. And they had gotten, in effect, what we would call an injunction from the king ordering that work on the temple cease. And because accusations were made, well, you know, they're up to something and they're up to no good. And there were all these problems and all these difficulties. And a lot of people looked at it and said, well, you know, it's just not time to build a temple. Not time. Time's not come. The word of the Lord came to Haggai saying, verse 4, Is it time for you, O you, to dwell in your sealed houses and this house lie waste? You don't think it's time to build God's house, but I notice you've found time to build your own. 
you're sort of getting comfortable. You think it's time to build your house and not time to build mine? You know, it's easy, natural for us as human beings to do what? To turn inward and be focused on self. You know, if I don't feel good, I'm very conscious of it. If you don't feel good, I may or may not even know about it, right? Uh, you know, if, 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 if I'm hurting, I'm consciously aware of it, you know, every moment. I mean, every time the pain throbs, uh, I am deeply aware of it. If you're hurting, nobody's as much aware of it as you are, are they? It's easy, it's natural. For us to be aware of ourselves, our needs, our wants. If I'm hungry, I know it. If I'm thirsty, I know it. So it's very easy for us to be self-focused. Now, the people had met problems and, dis- and dis- discouragements and difficulties. They concluded that it wasn't time to do God's work, but they found a way to do their own. So they, had, they built their sealed houses. God said through Haggai, verse 5, now, you go and consider your ways. You've sown much and bring in little. You eat, but you don't have enough. You drink, but you haven't, you're not filled with drink. You clothe you, but there's none warm. He that earns wages, earns wages to put it in a bag with holes. You ever feel like that? You know, it's, it's like you, you got your paycheck and you cashed it and you look, you look in the bag and it's like, where did it all go? It's sort of, it's like you put it in a bag with holes. You see, the people, were focused on themselves. And yet, no matter how focused they were on trying to provide their own needs, it never, it didn't seem to be working out. How in the world could they build the temple? I mean, they couldn't even take care of themselves, right? Hey, I said, look, consider your ways, verse 7. You go up to the mountain and bring wood and build a house and I'll take pleasure in it and I'll be glorified. You looked for much and it came to little. What you brought it, when you brought it home, I did blow on it. Why is that, God says? Because of my house that is waste. And you run every man to his own house. My house is waste. You're concerned about yourself. So God says, I've brought all these, this uh, famine and difficulty. So Zerubbabel and Joshua, verse 12, and the remnant obeyed the voice of the Lord and the words of Haggai. And verse 14, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel and the spirit of Joshua and the spirit of the remnant. And they came and did work in the house. And so, it describes here another message of God. In the seventh month, Haggai received another message. Chapter 2, verse 2. Speaking to Zerubbabel and Joshua, to the residue of the people. Verse 3, who is among you? that saw this house in her first glory. And how do you see it now? Is it not in your eyes in comparison of it is nothing? There were a few elderly individuals on up that have to be, it's been almost 70 years since the temple was destroyed. So you're looking at people that had to be up around 80 years of age or older to really have much conscious memory of the old temple. But there were a few left who could remember that temple. And what they saw was a much smaller, less impressive building taking shape. It's just like nothing, isn't it? By comparison, those of you who remember the old temple. Now be strong, Zerubbabel and Joshua. Be strong, all you people of the land, verse 4. And work, for I am with you, says the Lord of hosts. According to the word that I covenanted with you when I came out of Egypt, my spirit remains among you. Fear you not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet it is one, yet once it is a little while, and I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. I will shake all nations, and the desire of all nations shall come, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine. Verse 9, the glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former says the Lord of hosts, and in this place will I give peace. Now, the temple was not nearly as impressive a building physically. There was no divine fire that came out and ignited the offering at the dedication. There was no 
visible glory of God that filled the second temple, as was the case at the dedication of Solomon's temple, and as had been the, dedica- as had been the case almost 500 years uh, earlier at the dedication of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And yet, Haggai told the people, be strong and work. Do what you're called to do, because yet it is a little while, and I'll shake the heavens and the earth. I'll shake all nations, and the desire of all nations will come. And I'm going to fill this house with glory. And the glory of this latter house will be greater than the glory of the former. How could that be? This latter house, the Ark of the Covenant, the visible symbol of God, wasn't present. None of these other things that had occurred earlier that would be so impressive humanly, those things had not happened, and yet a promise was made, and Haggai said, it's a little while. And I'll do that. You know how long a little while is with God? In this case, it turned out to be about 500 years. Because you see, God did glorify this second temple. This is the second temple. It was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Herod expanded the temple. Primarily what he did was expand the the courtyard. You know, the temple building itself... Only the priest came into and nobody except the high priest went back into the Holy of Holies. But there were courtyards and porches and porticos and and, uh, outbuildings and all sorts of things uh, that were there. Herod uh, came in and expanded the Temple Mount by building retaining walls and filling them in with rock and dirt uh, and expanded the Temple Mount out to include about 37 acres, almost 40 acres uh, is what it wound up, started out to be much smaller, maybe uh, 10 or 12 acres. So it was a massive project when you, in effect, uh, because it was on this sort of mountainous, uh, you know, this hill, uh, Mount Moriah, and so what he did was build this, this retaining wall out and fill it in. So he expanded it out, That's an, and, you know, then expanded out the walls and the courtyards and built all these porches and all of these things uh, that were there uh, in the Temple of Herod. But the temple itself was the Temple of Zerubbabel. It was the second temple. How was it filled with that glory? It was filled with glory because the one, not simply a cloud coming in, but the one who had written the Ten Commandments with his own finger on tables of stone, that one walked in to that temple. We're introduced, you know, in Malachi chapter 3, it says... Behold, verse 1, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he'll prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom you delight in, says the Lord of hosts. Who may abide the day of his coming? Who will stand when he appears? He's like refiner's fire, like fuller's soap. You read in John chapter 2 of when Jesus Christ, at the inauguration of his ministry, walked into the temple at the time of the Passover. He had already been baptized by John in the fall, had undergone the 40 days of fasting and temptation by Satan in the wilderness, had gathered his disciples and came down and now boldly walked into the temple just prior to the Passover and inaugurated his ministry in quite a notable way. He walked in, and the first thing he did was he started turning over tables. He planted a little whip out of some cords because they had, you know, made they, the priests had turned the uh, uh, the outer courtyard called the court of the Gentiles. They had turned it into a marketplace, and they were peddling uh, goats and sheep and, and cattle and doves and all these things, uh, selling them for sacrifices. And not only that, they were. They had set up a, cha- a money changer's table because they were ripping the people off twice. They sold them the animals at inflated cost, but they also said, look, you know, people are coming in from all over the Roman Empire and they have Roman money in their pocket. Just normal money. The priest said, oh no, you can't spend that in the temple. No, that's pagan money. It's got Caesar's picture on it. It's got all these pagan inscriptions around there. You can't spend that in the temple. So they set up a money changer table. And you exchange your Roman money for a temple shekel. Of course, the fact that the Roman money 
had perhaps about an ounce of silver in it, and the temple shekel had somewhere between two-thirds and three-quarters of an ounce. Uh, that made for a pretty good profit. That's about 25-30% on, uh, you know, on each coin you change. So the first thing you do is you clip them on the money, and then you sell them the goats and the calves. They had quite a racket going. And it came to an abrupt end when this young man came walking in. And the next thing they knew, he had opened up the gates on these corrals where they had these animals and started popping the whip. You ever been in an auction barn and seen cattle run through a chute? Uh, it doesn't take much. You know, you pop the whip and you get them, uh, you, you have them going out through a narrow place and boy, they are on top of each other. And, and you can just imagine the pandemonium. He knocked over the dove cages and you had doves flying everywhere. You had money uh, changers tables turning over and here were people scrambling around trying to collect the money. You don't think the money changers were just going to walk off and leave their money, do you? Uh, pandemonium broke loose. It was quite a stir. It was the most dra dramatic event that had happened in the temple in a long time. And then this young man who came in and stirred up all the commotion began to preach. And he began to reach out and heal people and perform miracles. That's described in John chapter 2. That he did these miracles there in the temple during the days of unleavened bread. See, the uh, um, verse 23 of John 2. When he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. So we find here during the festival, a certain man of the Pharisees, Nicodemus, came to him privately by night and said, Rabbi, we know you're a teacher sent from God. Because no one can do what you do except God be with him. Nicodemus was a member of the Sanhedrin. He was part of the ruling council of the Jews. He said, you know, we've talked it over, and we know that you're a prophet. We're, we know you're a man sent from God. No one could do what you're doing without God being with him. You see, the Lord came suddenly to his temple. A messenger was sent before to prepare the way, John the Baptist. Now, you know, it's a remarkable thing. God said, I'll shape all nations, and the desire of all nations will come. You know, you go back and you read in the book of Luke, how God worked and shook the rulers of the Roman Empire itself. Luke tells us that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed, and everyone should go to his own city. There was a man by the name of Joseph who lived up in Nazareth. His espoused wife had miraculously conceived of the Holy Spirit, Mary. That story is told there in Luke chapter 1. Now she is far advanced in her pregnancy. And they live in Nazareth, way up in Galilee. There is a prophecy in the book of Micah that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, the city of David. What in the world would induce a man to make a long trip with his pregnant wife? A decree from Caesar went out that made no exceptions and ordered everyone to go to their city and to pay to take part in the census there for the purpose of taxation. God shook all nations. Here was, here was Caesar, the, the great ruler of the Roman Empire in Rome, and he issues a decree at the right time, moving people all over for the purpose of getting the right person to the right place at the right time. You know, God has ways of doing things, making sure events converge. You know, after the birth of Jesus, an angel appeared to shepherds who were out in the field watching their flock and told them that there in Bethlehem, a Savior was born. The Messiah had been born. 
And they see this great dramatic event and this whole heavenly choir appears to them. A tremendous event. You know, the angel could have told them exactly what house to go to. He just said, in Bethlehem, and the way you'll know him is you'll find that he's laying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, that ensured that the shepherds had to go to Bethlehem, and they're buzzing all over the place, asking everybody they meet, knocking on all the doors to try to find. So that, you know, word spreads quickly. God has ways, you see. All of this time came by. God worked in, in circumstances to bring about the birth of the messenger, John the Baptist. To bring about the birth of the Messiah, Emmanuel, God with us. Who walked into that temple that had waited 500 years for the glory of God. And the glory of God now came into that temple. Far surpassing anything else because the one to whom the worship should have been direct. God in the flesh, God with us, was in that temple proclaiming the message, the gospel of the kingdom of God. Power of God was evidence. You could go on through the story and in the aftermath of His crucifixion and resurrection, You know, the fire did come down. You read of it in Acts 1. It came down and sat on the, over the heads of the apostles. And a rushing mighty wind. And the Spirit of God was poured out. And you read as you go through the book of Acts, the apostles preaching there in Solomon's porch there in the temple. God's power was poured out. The people of Zerubbabel's day were given a work to do. And they were told not to make excuses, but to be strong and to do the work that God had given them to do, and to trust that in God's time, what they were doing looked pretty small and insignificant. And those who remembered the temple of Solomon were discouraged because they said, this doesn't amount to anything. And God said, don't ever mistake the fact that I can make it far more glorious than anything that's ever been. Because I'm going to fill it with greater glory. The glory of the Messiah Himself. John tells us in John 1 that in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Without Him was not anything made that was made. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Glory that far transcended the glory of Solomon's temple to the tabernacle of Moses. You see, those things were based on a pattern. The pattern given in the mount. But it was a pattern of heavenly things that pointed to the Messiah, His coming, and His ministry. Paul describes it in detail in Hebrews 8, 9, and 10. Brethren, yet once it is a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry.